Welcome to Harder Than It Looks, Parking Uncovered, a podcast that illuminates real solutions to common problems within the parking industry. I'm your host, Brian Wolf, CEO of Parker Technology, and in each episode, I'll introduce you to real parking pros that will bring their own tips, tricks, and best practices to manage what we all know is harder than it looks, parking a car. Okay, on the show today is Alejandra Alex Argudin, CAP. Alex Argudin is the Chief Executive Officer of Miami Parking Authority, MPA, an award-winning parking organization recognized for disrupting traditional business models. As the CEO of MPA, Alex oversees aspects, all aspects of the authority. She has transformed MPA from a traditional parking organization to a multifaceted, multidisciplinary entity that integrates micro-mobility, public-private partnerships, and a suite of smart cities digital technologies to manage the curb in dense urban core areas, thus enhancing mobility. That is a mouthful. Alex is on a mission to crystallize a new vision for the parking business and is passionate about economic, social prosperity, and the importance of leaving a better society for future generations. Alex is a modern leader who injects her enthusiasm and energy into everything she develops and inspires and influences her staff to find solutions that enhance the quality of life, the community they serve. She was recently, congratulations, installed as the chair of the International Parking and Mobility Institute's board and is the current chair of the WOW Center. We'll talk about that in a minute. And a member of her alma mater's Florida International University's President's Council, among other organizations. In other words, she's really busy. Alex, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Harder Than It Looks. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is great. I appreciate you carving out the time. You're obviously super busy. You've got a lot going on, not to mention parking a bunch of cars in the city of Miami, which that melts my brain just thinking about it. So congratulations for that. All right. So one of the things that I like to do is with with my guests is I, I like to hand them the mic and t- and tell you you can go back as far as you want to go and uh, and just tell us how you went from one place to the next where you started and how you went from one place to the next because ultimately it'll end up with how you how you got to be where you are as the CEO of the Miami Parking Authority so the mic is yours tell us your story Ryan. So, and if I miss anything, you'll be able to read it in the Park and Mobility magazine. Um, <laughs> Melissa did such a phenomenal job in writing. She and, really did. Yeah, more so it captured exactly who I am. Um, yeah. So so it's a great article, but I, I did start my career in, in the public sector. When I was 14 years old, I, my dad had passed away and the city of Miami had a summer youth program where they would have uh, kids with low income come and work in, in, they would partner with different entities, different uh, private sector entities, whether it was a dry cleaner or a bank or, and to do, you know, small work. I got lucky enough that my job happened to be, you know, answering phones at the city of Miami. And that's how I started my career. And okay. phone, I remember, everybody remembers that I, I would come in my little cheerleading outfit and then change in the bathroom and then put some kind of professional clothes on and, and I would work 10 hours a week. and. But by the way, that was enough money to even make make more for my family than my mom was bringing in as a factory worker, right? So I started working at a very young age and it taught me a lot of uh, discipline and um, what it meant to, to work and provide. And so I made a career in the public sector starting at, at that young age. And I went through for 14 years. So I did my high school career, my college career. I got married while I was there. So I have fond memories of the city Plus, I was able to grow professionally. They gave me a lot of opportunity to grow professionally. And for that, I'm forever grateful. Uh, then I I was managing, or the, the parking authority was actually managing some parking for me uh, while I was managing the public facilities for the city of Miami. So I became very close friends with Romy at the time and, and Chester and not so much Art uh, because Art was the head of the parking authority. And so we always had a very interesting relationship. But, you know, um, time came where he he asked me if, you know, I was interested in coming to work for the parking authority. And, and I jumped over in uh, 2006, not knowing what I was getting myself into. So I jumped over to the, uh, the parking industry, uh, pretty much doing development. So my first project was to build the, the office that I'm in right now, which is a, a new parking uh, facility. It was a real old parking structure that yeah. needs to be redeveloped. So we built this garage and my contribution was that I had been in the city so long that I had so many friends at the city that I was able to pass, 
you know, go to, in front of the commission and, and get the project moving. And so we built this garage in about 18 months. Uh, and that was my, my, my first, you know, accomplishment as, uh, as in, in the parking industry. Uh, I also remember doing my first performa. Uh, and, and it took me about two weeks. And I didn't know what the hell that was. And it took us two weeks, me and somebody else that worked with me and Art took five seconds, a look at the performer. And he's like, these numbers are wrong. I'm like, I've been working on these numbers for two weeks. No way they're wrong. There's no way. And it was, it was just, there was a flaw in, um, in an Excel sheet in a formula. And I learned a lot from that mistake. I have never made that mistake again. And, and I think that's something that's something that I take a lot of pride in. That things happen to me pretty much once and they never happen to me again. But I learned a lot about parking through that performer, you know, so how to take off yeah. easy counts and, 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 you know, how to do turnovers and, and so counts. And, and so I've been able to work with my operations team a lot from that one experience. And yeah. from then on, you know, something that I thought about uh, before we, we did this interview is I was always on the development side and uh, things got tough. And, you know, in 2008, Things got really tough, you know, in the economy. And one of the things that they first take a look at when you're in the public sector is, okay, who could go? Who, who are we going to cut off? What's going to happen yeah. to us? And I remember coming to Art and telling him, look, I, I get that you may have to lob me off. And I think I, I should be the one to go, you know, because of my salary and there's nothing else to build here right now. And everything, the, the economy has gone, uh, you know, haywire. And he's like, you're not going anywhere. Relax. We're going to figure this out. And, you know, something will bounce back. And at that time, I thought, you know, I really want to learn the operations because even if I have to bounce out, I, I, I love the idea of parking. I don't understand it so well but yeah. if i could learn the operations i could go work anywhere else i was young enough i knew i could get a job anywhere else i was more concerned about the people who had been here a long time losing their jobs one thing led to another and I, one day i sat with him i said look let me learn the operations and then if you need to if you need to cut heads cut me i i will find the job i'm not concerned about that i'd rather you keep other people here that this is all they've got they've been here for so many years and um he said all right just learn the operations, but you're not going anywhere. I started going into the operations and learning, and soon enough, the person that was in that position, a week or two later, left, was designing. He had gotten another job in the private sector. So he called me, he says, uh, put me on speaker. The three of us are gonna speak. You have two weeks to learn this job now because he's gonna leave and you wanted this opportunity. Now you gotta dive into it. I thought, oh my God, all right, I got this. So, so I think that that was the hardest thing for me in parking. and. I, I, I want to tell the young folks out there that you could do whatever you set your mind to, right? I asked. Yeah. If I wouldn't have asked, I don't know if I would have gotten that opportunity. Just because a lot of people here and anybody who knows about my organization, they have been here for 20 plus years. I don't think I have anybody here who has less than 15 years. So they were all much, not older in age than me, but they have a lot more experience in the industry than me. Yeah. So sitting in that desk and, you know, having to gain their respect taught me a lot. You know, I would put in yeah. a lot of hours. I would put in a lot of time um, to learn as much as I could. I did learn a lot as much as I could in those two weeks. And I really loved the operations part of what we do. And yeah. so, but I'm always forever grateful that I asked and that I was given the opportunity. And a lot of people don't take that opportunity. They think, oh, it's too big for me. You know, they're never going to support me. And yeah. um, I, I, I was fortunate enough. Does that happen to everybody? Maybe not. But but you're never going to know it unless you ask. So, yep. and so, you know, I would say probably five years went by or probably four years went by and Art had this opportunity to become the city manager for the city of Miami. So that opened the opportunity for me to apply for his job and become the CEO of the, the parking authority. And so I became the, the CEO of the parking authority a week before the pandemic closed it, right? So, <laughs> so here I am a week later, I'm cl closing this place down. Um, and I, I have to tell you, I've grown a lot from that experience just because I, I learned that you're only as good as, as the people who surround you. I, my, my, my senior staff stayed with me. I came to the office every single day in part because I couldn't deal with my kids doing homework from, from, from home. And I, everybody who knows me knows that I don't have patience. Like I love my children because they're mine. Um, but boy, I did that one day and I'm like, oh, I'm never doing this again. So I came to the office. I, it gave me a lot of time to read and to understand what R had left behind and the projects. And, um, and I also had a really, I, I, I had this appreciation for my senior staff that didn't leave me alone because they knew this was a tough time for me. And I also wanted to be an example for my staff that was on the street. Um, you know, because they have to come to work. People don't realize that yeah. we have a very complicated job and a job that requires for us to be here present and not just working from home. So um, 
and I always wanted to be an example for that. And, and four years later, here I am. Uh, a lot has changed from then. I thought that coming into this job, Brian, that I, I had such big shoes to fill and art had accomplished so much for, for MPA and had put us on the map. And we were seen as such a different organization, more than just parking. And then I thought, well, how else can I grow? And we have grown into this like motion. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. And I'm, pr I'm proud of the people that surround me that's helped me get there. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, so uh, thank you for the story and uh, for taking us all the way back. So you were answering phones at 14 years old. Were these old. were these people yelling at I you? Remember, I mean, the age now you have an age that you, you can't work on. But back then I was about to be 15. So my 15th birthday was on October and this was like in July. I got the job. So they're like three months. We'll get her in for three months. And that's that's when I started. Yeah. Yeah. And what kind of calls were you taking? Were these happy people? I'm guessing they were. Well, well, it wasn't in parking. So yeah, I was happy. You know, if I, oh. I would have started here, I think I would have cried. But but <laughs> it was in asset management. So, you know, it was, hey, I need to speak to so-and-so. Hey, I need, remember at that time, then we had direct calls. It was like you had that, it was like a, a like a, yeah. a board and you would just click people onto, you know, you would pass the phone calls through. So yeah, I did a really good job. I never had a mistake. In, I actually made one mistake in, in my, my entire time there, um, sending mail to the wrong people. I switched to people out. I also remember the little <laughs> things in life that I remember. I never did that again either. Um, but yeah, that's what I did. And, and they also allowed me to learn a lot about asset management and how to yeah, have right. the assets for the city. And, and so listen, I had, I had very good that I looked up to and they always took me under their wing. So I'm forever internally grateful to them. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, so answering the phones. And then the other thing that I picked up is, uh, you've got a, you've got a big servant's heart. So telling Art that take me out first because the, the people that have yeah. worked here a long time need the jobs. That's that that comes through loud and clear. And then of course, uh, we are not nearly as good as we think we are. It's really our staffs that that uh, that get things done. And I couldn't agree with you more. So I appreciate that very much. Okay, so so in the backgrounder. You talked about crystallizing a new vision and you said, okay, so Art had done it all. I've got to do something different. You're this new vision. So now I'm going to ask you to, to, to go back four years and you can brag a little bit. Give me a snapshot of the before and the after look now, four years later and the things that you've accomplished and then ultimately where you're headed. Because, you know, crystallizing means that you've, you've got it and you're continuing to work on it. So where you, where did you start and where are you headed? So the biggest thing we did here was go to mobile payment. And we did that, uh, people seeing 13. And now I would say it's about, I don't know, probably 15 years ago. I mean, it was, we were one of the first people to, to put that through. And, and we started eliminating um, machines off our, our street just because it became a cost thing. It wasn't because of anything else, but it was a cost thing. And our revenues went through the roof. Uh, you know, it was the convenience of people being able to use this app and yeah. the apps were just coming out. Now everybody uses an app, right? But, but at the time it wasn't, it wasn't that. And so he took a big risk in putting yeah. this out there. And we learned a lot from that time that communication was key. We marketed the hell out of the, the program, right? And, yeah. and um, I think that, that, that's a testament to our success. But yeah. then, you know, so we did that. Uh, we, we tried to cut costs where we could. We, uh, the, 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 um, the, the parking garages had the equipment that was antiquated. So we did, did new equipment. We took people out of the, of yeah. the booth, you know, so we didn't have a lot of people touching money, which was a, a lot of bleed because of people touching money. So you had all that, that's what he did. Right. And I thought, okay, well, what do I do now? Like, uh, what else do, what technology, technology hadn't rolled out the way it has now. We all right. had aging structures. And yeah. one of the things we hadn't been able to do is develop. We, we developed this garage, but it's a standalone garage. If I knew then what I know now, would I have done this garage alone, having the height that I have here? We don't have any restriction in height here in, in, the, in, in the core, in the, in the CBD, right? In the central business. Would I have done what I did now? Probably not. I probably would have done something different. There, you know, there's a housing crisis. Uh, there is, the land is super expensive. During that time, especially during COVID, we're like, okay, what, okay, what do we do here? Uh, what what do we start planning for? Since a lot of things are not moving right now, yep. what do we start planning for? Besides getting people back in and giving people a reduction in price, you know, in in in, in cost to park in our garages and giving people a way to get around without using their cars, we did all those plans as all of us did throughout the country, right? All of us in the parking world. Uh, but yeah. one of the things we started 
thinking about was, okay, when this all goes away, what are we left with? Like, what do we do? What do we do with our aging structures? Because I have a 40 year certification for most of my garages, they're all old. Um, is there an opportunity? Yeah. And there was, and one thing led to another. And here I am, I have five development projects on my lap right now, which I wow. was not anticipating. And and it, development wasn't my strength. So, you know, I, I surrounded myself with a really good consultant that has been my the person that I've learned from. Uh, you learn a lot, you how through this process that you don't know everything, right? And that, that and yeah. I think that's a quality that when you don't know anything, you surround yourself with people who do. And yeah. we were able to build a parking. Uh, we're, we're starting the pro of redeveloping one of our aging structures with 400 parking spaces, Brian, that we used to have to close at five in the afternoon because there was nobody parking there. And so we, we you know, we shut it down, we shut off the lights, the electrical, so we could save ourselves some money. So now building a 700 space garage that has, you know, 700 units above. And uh, we are going to be okay. a hub for everyone in that vicinity because everybody else is building without parking. So yeah. it's not just building parking. And I, and I think that that for us is something that I like to get across. And when I meet with transportation planners, like, oh, they hate parking. They're like, you know, parking people. Why are you building so much parking? We should not build parking. But if we build correctly, we build a mobility hub. We become the mobility hub along with parking yeah. to address yeah. the issues for that vicinity that we could be that centralized, you know, look, why not? Like, why are, why are you using us? We own the property. It's very hard to get property to build. And no developer right. wants to build these days because at least parking is very expensive. So yep. it's a loss leader for them, but it's great for us, right? This is what, so I was able to do that and, and finish that deal where we, we tore down that garage and we're about to get started on, on the building of that garage. We entered into another, uh, into another, um, agreement with another developer for another structure that's going to have 1200 units and it's going to have affordable unit uh that's 400 1400 spaces then that led to a, uh, a just a conversation with a developer that she's amazing she's an amazing developer she's a community activist and someone that builds and and builds for the community and so she's like hey you want a partner and then all of a sudden ryan one thing that i feel some people don't you know, they see the parking industry and government entities as, oh, they don't know enough. They don't have the professionals. They are not. Slow to move. Yeah, yeah. They, they get tickets for a living. And in my mind, if, I, if you told, if you asked me what has been the hardest thing for you, I, I, I would say it's been working hard to earn that respect but from my peers and from the private industry that there's a lot of talented really good professionals in, in, in our industry and in government that, you yeah. know what, choose to be in this, to be better for the community and do better for the community and, and do better for, for, for everybody who surrounds us. Right. And so yeah. I, that was one of the things that I have fought through in the past four years. And we, I think I've established the MPA and myself as, as someone who you could call and get a respectable answer. If it's yes, it's yes. And if it's no, it's no. Um, and then we yeah. move on. I don't, I don't like to lead people on. I don't like to drag people through and, 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 you know, keep them thinking that we're going to do something that we're not. It's not who I am. And sometimes people say, yeah, you gotta be more political. And I'm like, it's just not who I am. Right. It's, I, I'd rather be honest. Right. And sometimes my, but, um, for some people, but, but the truth is that that led to that. And then that led to another developer calling me, Hey, do you want to do this deal? And, and I'm like, yeah, this is a great deal for us. I, I really want to be here, but I don't own the land. Um, and we can't afford the land. Don't, don't worry. We'll give you the land because what they want is the parking. So they yeah. realized, Hey, we could create a great synergy with the industry. Um, and, and with, with, with this entity that we don't have to put in the money and we, but they, but I need the revenue and I need to provide the parking for, for the public. Yep. So it's become yep. a great partnership, but that hasn't come without the sweat and tears. And besides that, we have grown as an entity. I'm also a, a, a public authority, the parking authority. So we're the only ones in Florida, the only authority in Florida that also gives me a lot of flexibility. And I always say that because I could do a lot of things that a lot of probably departments of cities cannot do, right? So I always say that caveat because it makes it seem, oh, great, we could do all of this stuff, but I also have a lot of freedoms um, that yeah. a lot of people don't have. Um, and i am been able to provide our services to other cities. That has mm. been, that growth has been very important to us uh, to provide our services to other cities that are either too small, but still need our help, but they can't yeah. can put in a hundred and, you know, a hundred, enforcement officers right now they don't know how to do the job 
So if they're in our vicinity and we are able to provide them with a the service, we have grown our operations to other parts of the county, to other cities as well, providing that service. Wow. Yeah, that has been a great undertaking. And that was something that the operation staff, you know, we sit down, we say, okay, how, how do we want to grow? What do we want to do? What is our next step? How do we, how do we see ourselves in the next five years? And they looked for the opportunity and they said, Hey, Alex, would, yeah. you, would you consider this? And I'm like, oh, absolutely. Let's, let's do it. Um, and having those relationships with the, with the, with the, you know, the commissioners and the mayors and the, you know, the politicals, uh, were, we were able to open doors. And here we are already in, in one city and we're speaking to three other cities right now to go provide that service. That's awesome. So uh, so the first thing I'll say is uh, leadership matters and word got out that Alex is flexible and wants to do business, which is awesome. Maybe uh, just say a word more about the difference between being an authority so the, the Miami Parking Authority versus just a municipality, because that, that, that subtlety is lost on me right. and perhaps others. So we were established by the state as a parking okay. authority, a department of the state, and we got taken in to the city years later, right? So we're part of okay. their, of the code of the city, um, but we are, provide the service also for the county. The county looks at if we, which is, you know, it's like city, county, state. Um, yep. If we want, if they need parking services, they, they contact us for, for help. And we are able to do this throughout the state. And the difference is that we have, okay. we're like semi-autonomous. So we are managed by a five member private board. They're private citizens. They have to either live or work in the city uh, to be part of our board. And that gives us a lot of flexibility to do a lot of things because we're not caught in some system that, you know, handcuffs us to, yeah. you know, take three months to just get an answer, right? So we are able to yeah. move uh, a lot faster, a lot quicker, uh, but we are a government entity nonetheless. The city still has a hold on us as it relates to they approve our budget, they ratify our board members, if we want to go out for bonds, they got to approve our bonds. Uh, but we are great stewards of the city and we're great partners with the city and in, in providing them with even parking for the different districts, if they need them for parks and if they need them for anything that they need, we are the ones that provide that. We have our yeah. own. The other thing is that in our organization, we have finance, we have HR, we have, you know, we have our attorney, we have, so we are all our IT. So we're like a one-stop shop. So it makes it easier for us, yeah. you know, to yeah. get information sure. and to, you know, yeah, to produce information. So I, I'm very lucky in that way. That I'm not a department, so I'm not, a, you know, I'm not under finance in some city that gets locked, right, right and that they don't yeah. understand, and nobody understands what parking, you know, what people in parking. I'm lucky. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so thank you for that. That's uh, that does give you a lot of uh, latitude to do different things. But then the other thing that I would say is, so you, as someone who's open-minded, and then you match that up with developers and or private partnerships that understand and or appreciate parking for what it is, that to me is when the magic happens. Correct. Uh, you know, go back to your transportation manager who said that they hate parking. Yeah. I might argue that uh, that person or those individuals probably don't understand parking or don't certainly don't, they don't appreciate the fact that they can go to a baseball game and park their car and go to the game and then go home or go and go to their job and swipe their prox card and it works and the gate goes up. So they hate parking until they need to park themselves, which is actually sad. So we're on a mission together to you know, get people to appreciate parking people for the professionals that they are and for the difficulty of the job that they do every day under uh, massive pressure. I would imagine in Miami, parking cars is probably pretty hard. Yeah, there's a lot of we've talked a lot, you know, in the, in the past few years, we've talked about the reduction of cars. I get it. We, we, we talked about it. I am full to the to the gills. I, I came from a meeting just now, right before our meeting, I got back from a meeting and we have an area where we say our vehicles only. It's slammed. I said, what is going on? We, we're, <laughs> we're packed in here. We are filled to the gills. Like after, after the pandemic, I feel like we have more cars coming in than, yeah. than yep. we did before. So yep. cars are not going anywhere anytime soon. Nope. That is my friend. And so we got to find a place to put them. And I understand yeah. the mass transit. So, you know, I, mobility, transportation, you know, contributing to that, our contribution, you know, is, is hey, park with us and get on the metro and go somewhere else. You know, where, go to wherever you have to go. We'll give you a discount to park here. Being a partner as opposed to being the adversary, 
right? We're, we're, we're not winning if, if, if we're adversaries. I think we win more if we're right. partners in, in, in me helping the transportation world, you know, plan better, use us. You know, we, we, we can we can provide a lot of what you need without having to provide yep. little parking everywhere. We could we could be the central hub, but I think we need each other. I really do. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. We need each other. Like more people would say that, I think we'd get a lot further faster. Okay, so so let me uh, let me ask you, you. In the bio, we talked about being a modern leader. What, what does that mean to you? What, what what does it mean to be a modern leader? It, it it's being flexible and yeah. allowing allowing for people to think for themselves. And, and sometimes I do see the, the freight train coming at someone and I'm not saying that I wouldn't push them out of the way, but, <laughs> but I'm like, all right, we're going to learn because I learned that way. Right. I, I'm sure yeah. people saw the freight train coming my way and they're like, I mean, that performer, I never forget it. Right. And yeah. I'm sure he knew that I was going to make a mistake. And he's like, now you're going to learn of what I'm looking at, you know, and what I'm looking for and you don't make those mistakes. And so I, sometimes it's not the way that I want it to be. Sometimes things are not done the way you want them to be, but they're done and they're done well. And you know what? I, I want everybody to have their own leadership style and not my leadership style. And, and that's very hard for me because um, yeah. I'm a pretty strong character. So I've worked on that. And, and look, maybe it doesn't mean a lot to anybody else. But for me, I, I'm proud that I've allowed myself to allow people to be who they are. And, and yeah. because they're going to be leaders tomorrow, right? They're leaders today and they may be in my position tomorrow and they have to be able to lead the way they do, not the way I do. Um, yeah. And so at having that flexibility, you know, after the pandemic, a lot of people ask for that flexibility. Hey, can I work from home? Can I? And, you know, I'm not close minded to is it hard for me? Yes. Um, yes. I realize I'm not as young as I think I am um, <laughs> because sometimes I do do that. I'm like, oh, my God, I sound I sound older than what remind me of that all the time. Mm-hmm. But yeah. but I every idea doesn't have to be mine either. Brian, they come up with ideas and I and allowing them to do that has opened the doors for us immensely. They take yeah. a lot of pride in what they do. My staff grinds, they grind a lot. They drive grind yes. every day. And you know, the other day I had to take a step back and think, I, and we, we sat down and we had a meeting and I said, look, if I'm pushing too hard or I have, because they, they know I have a thousand ideas every day. Every day I come here, I'm like, we're gonna do, we're gonna conquer the world. This is what we're gonna do. Every day is something new. And I, and I, and they never tell me no, but I never want to drain them right yeah. and so yep. we sat down and said look if i if it's a lot and i know i could be a lot tell me push back and you know no one ever pushes back on me they're like okay if you're gonna give us carte blanche we're gonna move and i'm like oh, all right you know we will we'll take we'll the horns and we'll go i think that has allowed them to think outside the box be better leaders yeah. for themselves and see what works and what doesn't work Maybe we shouldn't have done that. Maybe we should have thought about this. I, I worry about growth because, by the way, it's a great idea. I love that we're growing. But do we have the staff to grow? Do we yeah. have the hours of the day to grow? Do Are we going to provide the same service that we that is our standard? Because if we're not, then that growth has to it has to take a different, you know, we, we got we to gotta yeah. slow it down a little bit. And, and those are important things, Brian. I could want to conquer the world, but if, if they're not behind me 100%, and then that's as good as nothing. Yeah. Nope, that's good. So I heard a couple of things that I think are important. Uh, empowering people for sure to, to think for themselves. Uh, results over uh, being wherever they you think they should be. I mean, I, I think we all agree that the world is beginning to appreciate that in person is it matters, uh, but there's also a level of flexibility that we have to be able to show so that folks feel like they're they're empowered to do the thing that makes them most productive and then ultimately hold them accountable for, you know, telling you when it's too much. Yeah. I, I totally, I, I couldn't agree more. We're, we're in a business where grinding is part of the job. Uh, you know, when you take 160,000 help calls a month, uh, it's a lot. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I'm, I like you, I'm sensitive to grinding people to a pulp because parking does that to you. Right. Those cars are showing up whether you're ready for them or not. We have the most exciting part of our business. I don't know how it is for you, but for me, I hear at least here, there is never a day that the same thing happens two days in a row. Like right. every day there's something new. And on Fridays is the best. Right. Fridays, everybody has an issue, a problem. They they forgot that they had sixty thousand people coming to an event on Saturday, you know, this whole thing. And and people don't realize that because we just make it happen. You don't see the work that goes into making these. Yep. That's what I mean, about. it's so one of the biggest, one of our biggest badges of honor for sure is that uh, someone will call us. We've got a couple of, a couple of uh, folks that just use the software and somebody didn't show up 
or one of their CSRs didn't show up or two of their CSRs didn't show up or whatever. They're like, hey, can you can you help us? And we're like, of course we can. Right. Even though it's going to put us under pressure just because we didn't plan for that. Um, but showing up for our customers and for our people is, is, is really key. Right. So I can, I can tell. I, I could appreciate that because I'd be that person. I need three people here, but like now, like not tomorrow, like five minutes from now, I need somebody here. Yeah. And it's expected by the way. It's it well. And, and so, you know, what, what happens is you begin to depend on folks like that. Yeah. And, uh, there, there is a balance between depending on somebody and a dependency, yeah. right? But just knowing that you can turn to partners uh, in a time of need is, is really important. That is, that yeah. is priceless. Yeah, for sure. So, okay. So how many people work for the Miami Parking Authority? We have about 160. Okay. All right. So that's actually a fraction of what I thought you were going to say, which makes it even more impressive yeah, that in the city of Miami. And then how many other municipalities do you help with their parking? Right now, uh, we do the county. And okay. the largest hospital, public hospital here is Jackson. We do all of their yeah. parking and uh, the city of Durham. Wow. And now we okay. have, a, and then now three cities have called me in the past three days. Like, hey, we need your help. But like this message was, I need, today was, I need your help. And it's kind of immediate. So how soon will you be able to start? I'm like, what do you mean to have passed legislation? Like there's so much that has to happen. It's so funny. People are, I haven't even given that message to anybody because I thought it was just funny. I, I got it when I sat down here. I was like, okay, all right, I'll call you. We can start tomorrow. You know, you've done something right when yeah. they're like, when they say, when can you start? Well, you know what? Like with, with the amount of people that you have and, and you're right when you put it in that Wow, you you do all of that with the same amount. Because by the way, that that number that I gave you is hasn't shifted in years. I think part of what happens is that you have to learn how to become more efficient, and technology has allowed for that, right? Uh, technology, I think, is going to be very helpful to entities like mine, be more efficient when you can get yep. folks. Because you know, in our business, there's a lot of turnover, and especially on the enforcement side. Uh, so. So that we've talked about that a lot in the past couple of weeks about, okay, how can we become better, you know, more efficient to allow yeah. us to provide the same, if not better service, but not count on bodies as much, uh, yep. you know, and use the technology because we do continue to grow. And so how do you do that? You know, how, wh where's the good happy balance? Yep. All right. Well, so th that will be a great transition to the topic of smarter cities. So as I'm sure you're aware, there are, there are those that believe smarter cities are a thing, and there are people that believe smarter cities are not quite ready for prime time. It sounds like you've at least cracked the nut, at least partially on smarter cities. Tell me about how you how you did it, like w what it took to get it done. So I'm, I'm cracking the nut, right? Yeah, well, sure, you're working on it right I now, think, of course. I think cracking the nut, it, it, the first thing we had to do is change legislation. Uh, yes. And I believe that that's where a lot of cities are gonna get stuck. It's easier because they just, you know, they could put a sentence or two or just address the one sentence in the curb having to do with it. For us, it's taking a look at the entire code and then making every change possible that we can that one time. I don't want to go in front of, of the commission more than one time, right, to make those changes. Yeah. And there, there are a lot of changes. These cities are have codes that are old. I'm, I'm changing code that's from 1970s and 1980s. So imagine what that reads like. They're still talking about the yeah. space meters and the coins. And so, yeah. so, I, so we're doing a holistic look. We took a holistic look at the, at the entire code. So that's the first thing that we have to do. That unlocks the opportunity for mailing invoices and doing, uh, you know, electronic citations and things that we don't do right now, Brian. And that takes a lot of time. You get out of the car, you yeah. see the enforcement officers in this weather going, putting a ticket in the, you know, in the front windshield because that's it's a windshield, you know, law. And so yeah. these are very antiquated things that they're great in theory. Hey, you know, this, this is great technology, except that we can never roll it out because the legislation doesn't let us. So I think that's been a hindrance for us, but there are things that we are working on. And we actually were part of a grant for a smart city grant with the county. And the grant was really based upon micro mobility, right? Micro transit. And yeah. so what we're working with them right now, and we're working with a couple of companies is, mm. all right, we have some cameras we've put on poles. We have found out a lot of information and people don't realize that. And, and I'm the first one to say, and my CFO is always telling us, we are data rich and information poor. So great, what are we doing with it? Like, what are we doing with the information? Yeah. How are we using it to better yeah. our system, better, you know, make us more efficient or how are we using it to, uh, you know, get people, educate the people and the public, right? And so yeah. we have tried different vendors right now and throughout the city to see what information are we getting and 
is it good information? Is the information that we need to then make our next step? How do we better manage our curve, right? Curve has been the key, that word, you know, every couple of years, our industry has like that word, right? <laughs> the buzzwords. Right. And so it's the curve, the curve and EV, and that's like the hot topic right now. And, and so we look, the curve has an issue right now. And I think the pandemic yeah. really accelerated that for sure uh, yep. and we have a lot of double parking and the city continues to grow and we have you know a million units coming into play right now and nowhere and our and our actual trend um the the infrastructure is not there so we yep. do have about three vendors we're working with right now uh we have cameras on 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 different uh, on different poles that give us different information that data i'm going to use to be able to sell the legislation to my commission here. This is the data. This is exactly what's happening. I'm not, you know, I'm not BSing you. I'm not, I'm not wanting yeah. to charge at the curb because I just want to make more money. No, this is why we're doing this. Um, yeah. And and data data says its own story, right? The data will provide yeah. the story that we need uh, to get the product passed. And so yeah. we are working on the curb. And with the smart city, is not only working on the curb, how to better manage the curb, but the micro freight is something that I'm very interested in, which is you know, having the UPSs and the, you know, the FedExes of the world park in one of our ancillary lots that are, is a little bit off the beaten path and having these micro units come in, you know, put, put the, the, you know, making all the deliveries in bikes and in different yeah. bikes. Do I think it's going to work during the pandemic? We tried it with DHL. I don't know if you have DHL where you're at, but it's all yeah. delivery, you know, that they do little smaller parcel deliveries. Yeah. And let me tell you, it worked. I, I'm happiest because they also use the bike lane. Our bike lanes are not great here in, in because they're like the bike lanes to nowhere. And because of our weather, you don't see a lot of people riding bike yet. I'm hoping that that takes off. I, I really do. I think the bike community always hates when I say that, but it's the truth. Um, it's taken away very valuable pieces of land yeah, for like, our retail yeah. and our restaurants, right? And yeah, so, sure. but if you could find other ways of using it, like having yeah. micro deliveries where you don't have the, the UPS and, and FedEx trucks, you know, double parking on the street or any delivery for that matter, yeah. that will start addressing the transportation issues and, you know, the, the traffic issues that we're having, especially during prime time of the day. So we are working on, on using the technology to get these things moving. Now, it yeah. take time. Yeah, I think we and I could have this conversation a year from now. Um, we have some really good partners uh, that yeah. have come to the table, like an Amazon. They're like, look, let's try, you know, let's try this. Let's try the delivery that way. Imagine a world where you don't have, you know, you have zones. And by the way, this exists uh, throughout the country. I mean, I think in Spain, they're already doing it where there's, you know, they have places where you cannot bring big trucks, you know, you can bring yeah. bikes. Um, so that's interesting. So I think it's going to happen in Miami. I'm not sure, but I, I think that it would alleviate a lot of the issues that we're having here. We have the grant. Why not try to put it in play? I do think yeah. that monitoring the curb, I'm dying to see the, the CDS and, you know, and, and all the rules of the, you know, of the OMF yeah. really take off um, yeah. to see how that works and how that functions. But I will tell you this, we are pretty ruthless. My, my, my staff, if you double park and you just leave your car in the middle of the street, you will get told. We've told FedEx trucks, trucks, which, and they hate us for it. But they don't, no longer want to receive that citation. Yeah. So they're calling us, telling us, okay, how can we partner with them? And, yeah. and so I think that we are working on, hey, can, can we allow them to park anywhere? Right now they have to park in a commercial loading zone. Can they park anywhere? Yeah. Any, 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 you know, any parking space on the street, just find a parking right. space, park there. You pay us, you, you go paying us using the technology and we'll bill you at the end of the month. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have it, you know, you will have your GIS. We know when you parked, when you make the delivery, when you left, it also helps the company. So what the companies are, are learning from this data is how long their drivers are taking, where the right. congestion is. So maybe they don't send their drivers to that location during those times. So it's, it's reciprocal. Like they're getting data that they need and we're getting the data that we need as well. Again, yeah. like I tell you, it's great in theory. We haven't put it in play yet, but if yeah. we do, and when we do. If that works, Brian, imagine, you know, you don't really have to park anywhere that you, uh, you know, the UPS park right here. No, you can park anywhere um, and we'll send you a bill at the end of the month and you could just, you know, use our regular parking spaces. So things may change at the curb uh, the way we see it. I know. Fingers crossed. I know. Fingers crossed. So uh, you, you talked about a couple of different things that I think uh, others are feeling your pain too. So uh, Romy was on this podcast probably a, a month or two yeah. ago and, and he was, yeah, he, he was enlightening me to the fact that 
it really is about legislation and policies that are getting in, in the way. And I, I just have to imagine that changing that is really hard. For some cities it is. Uh, for us it is yeah. just because I don't want to go back before this board multiple times. I want to take something right. back to them. I have to explain it to them. They always want to know, okay, so why are you impacting? Are you impacting mom and pop? Are you impacting the residents? Are you? So it's a lot of the, like I said, it's the education. Some people just roll yeah. things out, Brian, and it works, and that's great. We don't do that. We take a long time to educate the public, and you know, sometimes it's painful for me, but um, and for us to get things out. But you know what? I've learned that educating the public, they can never come back to us and say, you know, here you are, parking people. I already hate you. I hate you more now, uh, because you know, let's face it, we don't do a job that everybody loves, right? Especially when we give yeah. out citations. But but there is a purpose to what we do. We exist for a reason. And, and so if we do the education part of it, I, I, and I'll tell you the big, the big, the big guys, I, I'm, I worry about the little guys. I worry about the mom and pop, the electrician, the plumber that's coming in, the painter that's going to park there. How do I get the information to them that we have a new system in place that, you know, we'll take their license tag and then we'll send them a bill at the end of the month. How, how do I get that out? So we yes. have been working through the education part of it. And part of this smart city grant which by the way is something that uh, I had spoken to Sean about and something I want to bring to IPMI, uh, you know, something that I think the cities would benefit from is hearing how other cities are doing this, people who have received the smart grant and, you know, start yeah. working with the transportation planners and the mobility people and, and bring us together. We are one big, we, we cannot be in silos together. So I, I was thinking that as, as one of the things that we would do even next year at our conference is I, I worked with a panel in NACTO which by the way, when people talked about eliminating parking, somebody, woman stood up and clapped very loud. And I, I thought, wait, she hears that I'm a parking person. But um, it was an interesting, NACTO was interesting, but very smart people who have the right yeah. idea, but have to use us more, you know, they just have to use us better. And and um, yeah. I, and I, I want to be able to get the politicians on board. We, we have to get them on. Legislation is yeah. a big deal. And I do have a lot of cities that call me to tell me, hey, when your policies change, can you send me a copy? So I always feel, Brian, part of what I feel is I, I feel that I'm responsible for some of these smaller cities that don't have what I have, you know, within my own department, my attorneys, my that work on these things for me. So I want, yeah. I feel responsible for providing a good document for them so that they could have it because not everybody can yeah. make the mistakes I do. They can't afford it. I can, yeah. but and they can. You give them a, you give them a blueprint. I, I think that's awesome. Yeah. That's super helpful. Okay. Well, while we're on the topic, are there any other big things that you've got planned for IPMI as the, as the new chair? I mean, legislation is a big deal. And I, and I do think talking about the, the integration with transportation, mobility planners to involve us more in their conversation and bring them to the table is going to be very important. Look, that's besides the, the real, you know, the, the, the EV tolls. We haven't even gotten there yet. I think that's going to be a conversation for another day. I mean, I get up, I talk to them almost all the time, but I, you know, I, it's not there yet. It's not there yet yeah. here, but I think that's going to be part of people are, are looking at us. Okay. Can we put a, you know, a flying car on your roof? So are we building for that? Are we even thinking about that? Um, yeah. How do we play a role in that? We play a big role in a lot of the transportation and mobility um, um, industry, period. And I think that they don't use us as much as they should, uh, you know. And so I, I, I do feel that being a part of that conversation is going to be important for us to bring yep. to the table. I also want that the smaller cities and the people who participate, the universities, the airports, for them to hear, hey, how can we, uh, how can we get these grants, and how can we partner with each other, with other, you know, with the state and locals. Um, to get these grants, what have been the case studies? Because now there's some case studies and we can provide the answers to that. So it's bringing new people into our world that typically don't come to our conferences. Like I went to NAC, that typically doesn't happen. I want that yeah. to come to me, to us, yeah. to see at IPMI what we're about and what we bring to the table. Because by the way, we talk a good game about, but planners love that. They, they, the transportation the world and mobility world love that. So we need to have a better integration on Hey, by the way, I am, I have 20% of my new facility has to be EV ready. 20%, 20% is EV ready. That's a so, big number. So, but, but that's something that I want them to know. We're not, we're not against each other. We could work with each other. And so yeah. I am trying to bring them in as well. But policy is yeah. a big deal, especially with technology. I think technology companies have great technology that help us out a lot. Um, but, but if I can't get there, if I can't roll it out, Brian, what good is it for me? You know, so, yeah. so that, that's what I'm almost there. I think that by the time we roll out for next conference, my, my legislation would have changed and that opens the doors to 
a lot of vendors to seek opportunities and, and even with other states. That's awesome. All right. So let me, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit because uh, you mentioned in the, in the IPMR article, I article, and then of course in uh, in your bio, the uh, the organization, the charity Wow. I-, I would love to hear more about Wow. What's what's that all about, and so wow, how did you find them? And Wow is and- the the an organization for adults with disabilities. So okay. it's what I am very. That's like my 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 happy place, right? And I have a sister in law, Evie, who has Down syndrome, and she's my husband's sister. And um, so I've lived this through with her. And when I was able to get involved in the board. I got involved and now I've been the chair for quite some time. And I don't know how it is through other parts of the country, but here after the age of 18, you get a lot of help and parents get a lot of help through the age of 18. But once you're done with high school, they have very little places to, and if they do have a place to go, you don't know about it. Um, It's something that it's not very promoted. It's not very talked about, you know, they're not the majority of the population. So, you know, it's been my life mission uh, to, to really be involved and put them out there and, it put out there that there's a place like this that exists. There's many places like this that exist, but we strive to be the best and, and a place where, you know, we, we are able to bring them in there. Imagine so as you get older, you have aging parents too. So what happens when your parents pass and, and they have nowhere to go. Um, and mm-hmm. so what happens is that we teach them life skills. There's a lot of individuals that, you know, you could teach them life skills. And so they get jobs at Publix, they get jobs at Chick-fil-A and that we have really good partners that give jobs, yeah. uh, and they're able to maintain themselves and they get their checks and but we teach them their life skills we teach them how to cook um and we had a little angel a couple of years ago that came down she came to an event and you know she was our first donor and gave us five million dollars to start a new building because we're tapped out wow. uh, we're you know yeah. we are at a capacity so now we could add out another 200 adults um with disabilities or we like to say with abilities uh to 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 the organization and there we're going to really push the life skills so that we can push them out into the community and you know they could have a place to live and 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 work and make their money um so they're not that dependent on their parents that are pretty much all aging and so we're concerned about that and and as long as i can give to that that's a place that where if i'm having a tough day in the mornings that's where i drive to and then i work out of there for a couple of hours and they just bring a lot of joy to my life. Uh, you know, I, you, you've you never met a group of people who, I guess, because they don't have a care in the world, right? And they are just happy. Yeah. All they bring is happiness to you. And it's nice to be, to see that around you sometimes. You know, you get a lot of perspective yeah. in life when, when you're around these individuals. And so um, I'm very excited about that. We've raised a lot of money. Um, we've opened the doors to a lot of the politicals that didn't even know that this existed uh, especially through the pandemic and so we're ready to rock and roll we're going to put the shovels in the ground now for that new building um in january so i have a lot going on with that project as well but that that will be a legacy for me and a project that i it's probably one of my proudest things that i'll I'll leave on the board so what does wow stand for wow is just we called it wow we just called it wow like this is this is wow we are um and everything about it is that you know we had this big long name and we just actually had uh, the actual change we've always been you know also known as uh but it was a campaign that you know a a firm did for us and you know every time somebody goes to the center they're like wow this i didn't know this existed wow you guys so much and wow and and it's true they 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 do so much they they they're just a a joy to be around I, i i think everybody should just spend the day there and so one of the things that we've done and my children uh have been very exposed to this you know this community for so many years because of my sister in law and you learn a lot you learn a lot about how people look at individuals with disabilities and so them and their friends never look at my sister in law that way or her friends and and uh, yeah. we started a in a, a um you know an event for young young kids to go uh, high schoolers participate with them in a sport so they call it kick it for a while it's a it's a, a, a kickball tournament because they could kick it it's, it's easier for them and i'll yeah. tell you ryan it's been uh what a what an event that has become and now it's grown so much but we did it so that we can expose this community to the younger people because we're adults yeah. we understand it but kids don't understand it and and i wanted them to to feel you know what it is to have an adult with a disability or you know and, and it's everywhere around you 
And so now every, my son was just texting me this morning. He's like, when are we planning the next one? It's next year in March. And I'm like, concentrate in school and drop your phone. But, um, and I'm glad that you're all for it, but right now is not the right time, right? But I'm glad <laughs> that he's thinking that way. He's like, I need to get all the ambassadors. And they, they just, they took this by the, that was my older son. He, he took the bull by the horns and he did this event. And now he brought his college friends last year. I thought, I don't know how this is going to work out. And his college friends were like, Oh my God, I didn't even know this existed. That goes yeah. to show you that, you know, it's not something that's everywhere. You don't come across it all the time. And so if I could yeah. even expose one person and thank you for asking that question, that means a lot to me, you know, and exposing yeah. this community to the world is, is important. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. So you mentioned your boys. I also read that you were, you're a baseball mom. Uh, and so I, I, uh, I coached my son through, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years of baseball. Oh. We, we loved it. And so I, I, I miss, so my son's 22 now, so he's, he's pretty much done with baseball, although we do play a lot of golf, which is fun. Uh, but the baseball was so much fun to go watch. And so I, I could commiserate with you as you were talking about watching baseball all weekend, sometimes probably more than that. Yeah, all weekend. Yeah, it's, it's uh, somebody asked me this morning, what did you do for the summer? I had a meeting this morning. I said, I lived on a baseball field, but cool. I'm like, so you're thinking that because I traveled, it was a vacation. Okay. I went to Ohio. I went to North Carolina. I did not, I mean, really, do you think that that was a vacation? Um, but you know, my husband always reminds me cause he also coached, but you know, he's not coaching now. Um, and it, he reminds me this will be gone and you're going to miss it. You're going to see, you're going to miss yeah. it. And it's true. You know, my older son also went to college and, and, and stopped playing. And that was, I think, harder for us, especially his father, than it was for him. I think he was so upset that his dad was upset. Um, and it, was, it, it, it wasn't it was mad. It was sad that the time was over, yeah. right? Um, yeah. and, and he always says it. I, I'm glad I am where I am, but I miss it. I'm not going to tell you I don't miss baseball. I love playing yeah. with my friends. I love the sport. And now my little yeah. son is playing, um, which is a, it's, it's interesting. Him and his father are, like, very different, where my, my, my oldest and my husband are very much alike um most of my saturday for two hours refereeing the two of them while they weren't um but he made a great team and we're excited for him and and i you know i i think my white hairs have come out because of my children um but but listen i i'm enjoying every minute of it and you know what it keeps them out of trouble it keeps them busy. yeah and they're they're always busy they never stop and and you know what and, and it, 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 it taught them good time management discipline you know, look, they didn't have to work like I did. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that they didn't have to do that. But but they have, so, you know, they have something else. They had a sport. They had to dedicate their time yeah. to that. And uh, I think that's shaped them to be, you know, good humans, which is all I want yeah. them to be. Right? Yeah, that's exactly right. You're just trying to get them to the next level yeah. for sure. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let, let me transition now to what we call the lightning round. Oh. We're coming around the bend here. This has been good, but uh, all good things must come to an end eventually. Right. So uh, I've got a series of five or six questions. One, two, three, six questions. And and you don't have to answer quickly or you don't have to you don't have to make it a short answer. But I had, I asked the same question to everyone. So my first question is, what phrase are you known for? So if there is a phrase uttered around the office, Everyone knows that it originated at your desk. What is it? I'm not going to say it because it includes a curse word like that. Every time somebody hears that, they know it's me. Um, <laughs> uh, it's always like, I think I say that multiple times a day. Like I read things that I'm like, what is happening? But, um, but definitely, definitely they know that I'm always preaching. You're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. I, I think I always say that. I yeah. think I've said it multiple times here. So that is something. And I tell it to my kids and I tell it to my leadership. So they know that comes yeah. from me. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's good. Okay. So um, what is the hardest thing you've ever done in your life? Not parking. We'll get to that in a second. What's, what's the hardest thing you've ever done in your life? So in my life, I would say dealing with my mom's dementia. I think that was the hardest thing. Um, and so, yeah. you know, and I think a lot of us go through that. I think we're all at an age where our parents are, are older um, and at, at least me and my friends are all coming through that time. And so, you know, you don't realize how hard that could be. I mean, it's, it's, you could say it, mm. but when you deal with it, when you live with it, it's, that's, that was a really, that's been a tough transition for me, especially when she was my rock, you know what I mean? And you see someone so tough, you know, deteriorate like that and there's nothing you could do. So, you know, yeah. anything with Alzheimer's and, and dementia, I'm very sensitive to and, and um, you know, it's something that I hope that they find a cure. Uh, in our yeah, for sure. So did you lose your mom? No, 
she's still around. Okay. It's her body okay. that's bad, Brian. But the rest of her yeah. body, she could out probably outwalk me. Out, you know, she's she's a machine. She's a, yeah. You know, her mind. Is- it's uh, it's hard. My dad, uh, my I lost my dad three years ago, and he was he was stage four dementia, and uh, you know, fortunately. Uh, for for us, fortunately or unfortunately, um, he the the beginning of the end for him was when he broke his ankle. He he was up on the roof of his house. My mother told him not to do that yeah, when she was she him. and compound fracture. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, couldn't couldn't he, he lost his mobility, and then I think that was the beginning of the end. But the point of that is that his body failed before his. You know, he 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 it was it was hard yeah. anyway. So I'm I'm sorry for that. that. That is super hard. I've grown from that experience. I've I've really grown and I've really t- taken a different, you know, look at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta you gotta soak it up. You know your kids. You're of sound mind and body. You gotta yeah. you gotta love everybody up for sure. No question. I can understand why that would be hard. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'll put you on the spot as far as your parking job. What's the hardest part of your parking job today? The hardest part is not having enough time in the day with be there for staff sometimes i feel like i'm not connected with them and that's really hard for me uh i i i I am a people person i need to be around people all the time and i need to know that they're okay and and so you know sometimes i i feel that that's probably one of the hardest things uh yeah for sure okay all right so if you had a magic wand and you could wave it and fix (laughs) anything in parking what would you fix uh, uh, oh, um, ADA placards. If I had a magic wand, that would go away in a heartbeat. So I'm going to try and remember that. And the next time I see you, I won't, I, I won't bore everybody on the podcast. The next time I will tell you a story about ADA, abuse of ADA placards. I, I have, I, I have one. The bane of my existence and partially because of what I told you I do. So I, I am yeah. very sensitive uh, to the fact that, you know, sometimes my in-laws can't park with my sister-in-law in a a disabled spot because somebody who is going to the gym is parked there with a disabled spot. In Miami, I don't know if it's countrywide because I have really, um, you know, hyper focused on, on Miami and, and in, in Florida. You know, they give these out like candy. I, I even think that sometimes you can find them on Amazon. It's just and so I, it's it's really, it's really bad here. And yeah. you know, we've talked to the the disabled community uh, with the county and the city and, and what they want is accessibility. It's not about parking, it's not, it's not about payment. It's about accessibility. And so yes. they've taken away that accessibility from people who really need it. And I have a real big issue with that. Okay, we're gonna fix the ADA spaces. I get that. I'm sure they and don't. I know when that happens. Yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, when you're not parking cars, what do you do for fun? Besides the baseball field, I play pickleball. I like to play pickleball. Okay. Yeah. Pickleball. Yeah. Uh, how long have you played pickleball? Not long enough. Um, okay. It's the thing is that my friends like to play and then drink in the between. And so it's like a play and drink game. You know, I'm like, I don't think it's supposed to work out this way. But um, <laughs> but, but it's a lot of fun. And, um, and you know, I've taken up a little bit of golf with my son, too. Uh, the baseball player, okay. just, just like you. Uh, he took yeah. up uh, golf and he's actually pretty good at it. So... Um, I'm trying to be better at golf, but pickle is fun with my friends. So I've, I've been doing it for about probably, I would say a year and a half. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I, I've, I've played pickleball in Florida once. Uh, I am avoiding pickleball for one, for one reason. And that is they've told me, I've heard the rumor that pickleball is the new basketball for the orthopedic surgeons Achilles and knees and all yeah. that stuff i'm almost taking up pilates now like I'm, i think i'm gonna change from I, yeah i cannot afford to get have one more injury so so i don't want to plant that seed I, for you but right. I, i'm saying i'm gonna stick with low contact like golf yeah, for now four friends that have achilles ruptures Ugh. that's tough not that's even knees they're achilles that's, yeah yeah, that's a yeah. for sure all right so uh Last question is, what are you most proud of? Now, of course, you can have two answers because you'll say your boys and your family, which is fair. But then, so that that's sort of the default, which is good because you obviously have a great family and, and all of that. But what else are you most proud of? I'm most proud of like the organization that I've been able to build and the opportunity that I've been given, you know, and, and taking full advantage of that and not taking it for granted. So I'm, I'm most proud of that. And, you know, and, and I, I, not because I say it, I, I always ask, you know, and sometimes I ask my senior level staff, I'm like, be honest with me, you know, I, have I been a good leader to you? Because that, that is very important to me. Um, yeah. So I feel like that about my organization and I feel like that about the WOW Center and anything that I put my name to. And, and you know, some people have a, a huge resume of things that they're involved in and, 
and I purposely don't have that because I want to give 100% of myself to everything I do. And so, you know, if that means that I'm involved in three good organizations, two good organizations, or even one, I, I want to give it 100%, right? So. I think yeah. that's what I'm most proud of. That's awesome. Can I also, I, I, I didn't work this into the questions, but can I also uh, pay you a compliment? In your in the, in the article, the IPMI article, you attributed your success to hard work and the fact you did not use the fact that you were a woman as a crutch. You used it as just a reason to work harder and to outwork people, which I think is the point in a lot of cases, aside from the headwinds that you might have had in your career. So congratulations for taking a perspective of I'm just going to outwork you and I may be in a man's world and it's uh, hopefully it's changing. Yeah, I think hopefully we're getting better. Um, but you did not use that as an excuse. You just powered through it. So I appreciate that perspective a lot because that it that for me would be inspiring to say you know you just you just gotta you, gotta, you just gotta go to work and deliver you got it you gotta keep your head down and keep it moving i i, I will tell you i i know that people bring that up a lot and that we're in a male dominated industry which not anymore i mean what did this look like 18 years ago is not what it looks like today i wish had i known then what i know now i think i would have taken a picture of every conference i went to then and how our conferences yeah. look like now right just that is very yeah. telling um but funny story, I go by Alex and I know I have a, a distinct voice where if I'm on the phone with you, people think I'm a man, Mr. I, all my correspondence is Mr. And since I go by Alex, it's perfect. Like Mr. R. So they would come to the office and they would come meet me and they're like, well, we're here to meet with Alex. And I'm like, yeah, this is she. And they're like, no, but it's a guy. And I'm like, no. And you know how many times I got that? I can, I, at least, at least a half a dozen times, right? And I never That's saw fair. myself as, oh, a woman in a man's world. I was just like one of everybody else. I was a professional. I was sitting at the table. I was having a negotiation. I was talking about a product or whatever it was. And, and then we were done. And you know what? I, I, I never had that dis I never distinguished myself like, oh, uh, because I am a man, a woman or uh, because, um, I just did work hard. And like I told you before, you know, I, I wanted to prove to my staff, which by the way, were all men at the time. I, I am your peer. I We are going to work as hard alongside each other. And, you know, yeah. I want I want women that are growing through the system and, and young women to know that. They don't have to yeah. do that. You know, they, they, you work hard like everybody else. I, I feel the same for any woman or any man. You, you both have to work hard. It doesn't matter what, what you are. And so I appreciate that. You know what? What you just said means a lot more to me than anything um because i do pride myself of that and you yeah. know i i i want to be here because i i deserved it because i earned it not because it was given to me clearly you know, and yeah in life, nothing really has been given to me and I'm, I'm grateful for that and i always tell my kids you've been given a lot of stuff so you, you won't learn how to appreciate stuff until you have to work really hard for it right so um, wow. i appreciate yeah. everything i do because i've worked hard for it and 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 so that's how you learn how to appreciate life and opportunity yeah for sure all right. Well, I think that's a great place to uh, to bring it to a close. So again, Brian, thank you so much for the conversation. You made me feel very comfortable and I, I enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you again for your time. That's a wrap for segment one. We're going to take a break to tell you all about our exciting user conference Fusion 25 coming in May next year. And then stick around. You're not going to want to miss hearing from my next guest who will tell us all about something else that's harder than it looks, but not in parking. Stay tuned. Hey, Parker customers, want to connect, learn, and advance with the best in the parking industry? Then mark your calendars for Fusion 25, our exclusive user conference happening from May 27th to May 30th in 2025, right here in Indianapolis. Fusion 25 will be two days filled with sessions tailored to your partnership with Parker Technology, engaging workshops, networking, and exclusive access to new products and features. You'll also enjoy events and happy hours from some of our favorite spots right here in Indy. You'll leave the conference with a roadmap to make the most of our partnership, new connections with other Parker Technology clients, and fresh ideas to enhance your operations and customer experience. Don't miss out on Parker's inaugural user conference. Early bird registration opens on October 1st, but for now, you can visit parkertechnology.com forward slash to save the date. We'll see you in May 2025. Okay, welcome back to segment two of Harder Than It Looks. My guest for segment two is Barbie Valdez McDaniel, a woman who came highly recommended by Alex Argudine, 
whom you just heard in segment one. So this is a special one-two punch for you. As the Associate Director of the WOW Center, Barbie has spent 30 years serving and supporting adults with intellectual disabilities. She is deeply passionate about serving the special needs community with a mission to make Miami a more inclusive and integrated city. Her role at WOW allows her to support the incredible staff she has, create innovative programs, and collaborate with the next generation of educators to embrace change and make meaningful impacts in the lives of individuals. She takes particular pride in guiding families and new participants through the center's admissions process, ensuring they feel supported at every step of the way. As a servant leader, Barbie is driven by the belief that the individuals served by the WOW Center shape her shape her more than she shapes them. And beyond her professional work, she's a proud mother of two extraordinary children who inspire and push her every day and reinforce her life's mission. She's committed to giving back, frequently volunteering at events that not only nourish the soul, but also uplift their community. Barbie was born and raised in Miami and she has a love, as do I, boating, horseback riding, volleyball, and most of all, spending time with her family, friends, and traveling. Barbie, welcome to Harder Than It Looks. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. It's great to have you. So my first question, Alex thinks you walk on water, and I'm just interested in hearing the story about how you two got together and to hear stories about some of the work that you've done together at the WOW Center. Well, so um, I worked at another nonprofit for about 25 years, um, very similar to this, uh, just with uh, younger children with special needs and growing up through middle school, high school and adults. So um, I decided to take a different uh, mission in my life and go on to hospice care. Um, Alejandra has been part of this board for a long time as her sister-in-law. It comes to the program here. Um, she found out that I no longer worked at the Miami Learning Experience School. So Alejandra and I go way back. We went to high school together. You know, um, we have, you know, seen each other through the years. I, you know, always have admired the work that she's done in the community as I guess she has for me as well. And um, there was an, an employee of mine that was working here at the WOW and sort of put the two pieces together and said, you know, our former executive director, Nathie, and I have been sort of like leavey, living our lives parallel, you know, and um, always wanting to help each other's programs out and, and just, you know, living vicariously through each other. At that moment, you know, this this staff member said, you know, Barbie and you could really make a difference. You guys would be powerhouses together. And she's like, I know, but she's at the Miami Learning Experience School. She's like, actually, no, she left, she left about six months ago. And so when that happened, I think, uh, you know, you know, Nadi actually like said, called Alejandra and said, wait a minute, I heard that Barbie's no longer working there anymore. Can we reach out? And I said, no, absolutely. You know, they said, absolutely, whatever. Alejandra reached out and said, you know, um, I don't know what you're doing, but I don't think you're doing what your life's mission is, which is serving the special needs community. I need you here. I need you with me. I need you helping us. I need you paving the way. And I said, you know, um, give me a chance. I, I I really needed a little bit of a break, you know, just I was doing this this other work um, for myself. I had lost my parents and I needed some time to heal and, and, and go through that process of helping others through that process as well. And um, little by little, I started um, meeting with the staff here, just giving some ideas. Then little by little, I started going to lunch meetings. And little by little, Alejandra lured me in and was like, can you be part of our board? And I was like, absolutely. I would love, you know, to serve on the board of directors and help as much as I can and, and do what I can for this community that I love so much and I'm so passionate about. And so that's what ended up happening. I was on the board for a year and there was a point where I think Nadi was ready to retire and go work at the school where her children go. Let's do that. And I remember having a conversation with her saying, you know, that's that's an amazing opportunity. My kids grew up with me at the school. And um, and sometimes you just put your whole life and world into where your work is. And I think balance is great. So I'm glad that Nati took that opportunity to do that. And she says, well, guess what? I need you to lead the way. And while I'm gone, I need you here. And I know how, you know, how impactful you are in the community. And I trust you. And I want you to, you know, take this path. And I'll always be here supporting you always be here next to you, whatever you need. As we, as we go through this journey, as I'm changing to do one thing, this mission is very true and dear to her heart. So she wanted somebody to, to be here that she, that she also entrusted in. And so that's how that all came about. And, um, and we didn't get to work together as we, we hoped and dreamed, but, but 
she's always, you know, a phone call away and is always very embedded into what WOW is doing and, and our growth and where we're headed and where we're going. So it's it's been an incredible journey. You know, I thought I knew everything about the special needs community. And through the years, you know, being in this for about, you know, almost 30 years, this this impacted me a little different. Yeah. yeah. There's, so, yeah. yeah. So can you take us back and yes. tell us about the origins of your passion for the individuals with disabilities? Yes. So this started like right after high school. Um, I was working in the public school system and, um, you know, going to college, needed a job at that time, but didn't expect to be put as a one-on-one -on -one paired with an individual with special needs, but not knowing also that this um, individual was very frail and um, was not going to live long. At the moment, um, the family and the school decided to be very quiet about it and respectful to the individual, to, this, to the child that was very young. Um, I got to work with him for about a year and right before summer was going to be starting this individual, this student passed away and I wanted to be an interior designer. That's what I was going to go to school for. Little did I know that that little boy changed my life forever. And, um, they, I was just like, I mean, my heart, when the staff members had to sit me down and tell me this, I just, I couldn't believe it. I was very, I was 18 years old dealing with like my emotions, but then the understanding talking to my parents, just like trying to understand the parents and how they felt. So it was all like a whirlwind at that moment, thinking like, I can't get past this. I don't know if I could do this anymore. Right. Where I almost gave up and said, I love it so much. I might change my career path from interior designing into special ed. But actually that turning, that was my turning point where I said, if there's one, there's many and I'm here to serve and help. And I want to do what I can to continue and have my own little legacy. As the days go by, I can help one person at a time. So I worked at a at a company at Pillsbury, Latin America, and there was an there was an accountant. His girlfriend worked where I used to work, and he tells me she's gonna she's gonna be getting her master's, and she's gonna leave this place. I know how passionate you are about special needs, and this is just a, a summer job. Why don't you go and you know turn in your resume and meet with the executive director because they're hiring since my girlfriend is leaving. And I said, oh my gosh, like, this is like God sent. like, what's going yeah. on? There's like, yeah. Well, I went to my interview I sat down with Shannon and she gave me the job right there and then. She's like, you're hired. Yeah. And um, it's funny because she's in my office. I have a little picture of her. She, my executive director from the other program passed away a few years ago. I still call her my little guardian angel. You know, I feel like, you know, a little hair is always sticking up when you gotta go here, you're gonna do this now. Yeah. Gonna, your mission is this now, now we're gonna do this. And it's almost like before her passing, she paved the way in every single segment of where I worked and taught me, like wanted me to immerse myself in every single program. Um, as I got to the office, as I started doing a, a administration work, like learning the from the bottom up to yeah. getting where I was at a young age. And she had, she had that vision, she knew, she knew. And um, she kept it quiet. And, but I understood it after. And I, I, I consider that to be, you know, where I like say, are you doing that again, Shannon? Are you doing that like this to me again? So yeah. those are just like those little pivotal moments that make me realize that I am where I'm supposed to be. And yeah. that, that passion of giving for our communities is what I was born to do. Yeah. Well, I, I will tell you that it comes through loud and clear. I mean, in the 10 minutes that we've been together, it's obvious you have a giant heart. I I, uh, I, I had this vision, you were telling the story about when you met the 18-year-old the boy and you said your heart grew. I had this vision of the Grinch at the very end when his heart grows 10 sizes. I can't remember exactly what it was. So it was it was kind of like that, right? You, you, uh, you found your calling. And then of course, going back to Alex, although you call her Alejandra, uh, that's, I think that's interesting. I actually caught her by her. Maiden last name. Aha. Uh -huh. Her Chong. Okay. That's we're interesting. We're together. <laughs> <laughs> that's that, right. You know her. You know her last names. And yeah. So, yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's, it is about people. And if we know one thing about Alex and, and those that are listening now, they, they can hear that Alex is quite the connector. She is smart as a whip and she's connecting dots and she's all about putting the right people in the right places. And so I'm sure uh, you were, you, you could not escape her plan once, once she got into your uh, line of sight, That's which is right. really awesome. It's good. And the same as, as the, as the executive director, you know, she, she steered you, she led you and showed you what good looks like. So that now in the work that you do today, you can, you can do the same thing for the people that work for you. It's happening. 
That's great. Okay, so give us sort of a snapshot of the WOW Center and the things that you do for the special needs community. Okay, well, just walking through the doors here, um, there's this like spirit. It's this like spirit of joy, happiness. I'm just walking in the morning. I have a little ritual where I make sure all of the individuals have arrived safely where I'm glancing into the classrooms to make sure all of my staff is okay. Um, just making sure that everybody is where they need to be and that our hearts are clear and our minds are ready to go for the day. Um, it's a ritual that another staff member of mine, Lourdes, that's been here for 40 years does as well. And it, it just starts my day off. It starts my day off to, to doing all the, the work that needs to be done on a daily basis. You know, there's never a bad day, I think. It's almost like a race because you just go out and if you are, just you hang out with the individuals for a little while and, and you're, you're set to go, you're good to go. But I am in charge of making sure all of our staff, you know, I'm, I'm supporting my lead teachers and so making sure our education team is as well, uh, making sure that my, my leadership team is also doing well. Um, you know, we have operations, we have director of social services, director of our workforce. So we're out in the community and we're making things happen so that our individuals can work out in the field and be immersed and embraced in the community. That's something that we work really hard for and whatever doors are closed, I'm knocking on five more and yeah. getting some friends and family involved and, and picking at people's brains and making sure that we're brainstorming and we're getting it out there that we're not going to stop until we get things done. You know, we provide service for 200 individuals and we're going to be groundbreaking for another 200 more in our new building coming up in January. It's an exciting time. Um, yeah. There are changes that are happening at the moment. And since I'm the newbie, it's a little bit like, you know, these little waters that are like, oh my God, this girl. I'm like, everything is going to be great. I promise you yeah. that. And I see the happiness. I know that change is hard, but you see the light at the end of the tunnel where the brands are like, oh, wow, I get that now. And it makes sense. So you know, as I always say, like, I like, I like my, my home away from home, this being my second home to be, you know, as stress-free as possible, that we're a family, that yeah. we communicate when, when there's something that's not setting right, um, that we're, that we're making sure that all these changes are happening in a very organic way that everybody's involved and aware that there's no surprises, that everything that's done is, you know, clear and understood, but that they're owning it as well. And they're part of it. So, yeah. So I heard all kinds of really great leadership lessons there, right? So the, the, the concept of making sure everybody's aligned on the same page, uh, your walk around signals to people that you care about them. Uh, most people will run through walls for people that care for them. And, uh, and then just the ability to, to set direction and have passion for what you're doing. So you're gonna go from two to 400 and these are adults, right? So you're, you are trying to find places for them to work. Is that, is that a big piece of what you do or how, okay. how does, what's, what's really sort of the day-to-day -day mission of the, of the organization? So our center provides service for individuals from the ages of 22. Our oldest, our oldest individual is 76 years of age. But we have a different type of programming altogether for those yeah. aging population, which is called our wellness program. Um, the problem is that our, you know, the public schools, they end at a certain age that they can no longer service. So at the age of 22, it's almost like it stopped and yeah. our population is forgotten. Yeah. So instead of being home doing nothing, actually, this is a time where you, you know, if you don't use your brain, it sort of gets a little lost. And we start the onset dementia earlier on with our special needs population. So it's just keeping that brain going. You know, what are the things that they want? We also treat them like adults. So yeah. we want to know what they want to do. We, yeah. you know, we set goals for them that they want to accomplish. So all these things are put in place. Um, we, um, we have a, the program that we run has um, life and community that teaches them life skills, just like making sure that they're learning how to wash and dry, folding things, um, using simple things of cooking that that's not going to burn them, but just that they're able to eat in case someone is ran out and they had to go get something and they're not home. Yeah. So anything adult like that's very simple and basic we're doing. Also, they have time to understand what it is to have wait time in a salon doing their hair um, and almost having a job in there by taking a number, sitting down. We, we do all those type of things. The customer maybe wants, you know, 
a massage in their head for the males or aroma or, or, or that relaxing aroma. The yeah. girls get their nails done. And these are things that we do twice a week within all the classes that they get to pick those goals that they want to accomplish and do. Yeah. That we have community-based education, which is CB. They're taking them out into the community. They're purchasing things. They're learning how to pay. Um, and now we're installing something else in the new program, which is called community-based uh, instruction. So we're te teaching them, you know, the public tra transportation, but um, teaching here and then going out to, to these lessons in, in a curriculum. Um, we have art, we have music therapy, we have sports. So there's a lot of different programs within our program. And then we have the workforce. So some of them are learning basic skills in-house so they yeah. can be able to work in an office setting. Um, and then we're teaching them things that they want to do, like they want to work in the food industry, then we're trying to get them jobs and then training them. So if there's an opportunity to hire them, then they're able to get hired. And then they go into another program of ours. It's almost like they graduate, but we check up on them and we make sure that they're, everything is, you know, all of our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted. Yeah, that's awesome. So I, I will tell you that, um, there was a gentleman that I worked with in my first job. So this was a very long time ago. His name was Bob Pulfus and, and, and Bob was special needs, right? So we, we, uh, we, we bagged groceries together at Wolf supermarket. No, no relation to me. And I, I just remember Bob being, he, he, he was the one guy. So I'm, I'm a 16 year old kid and everybody else are, they're professionals, right? So they're doing their thing and it's a grocery store and all of that. And, and I could always count on Bob to help me, right? And so I grew this special attachment to Bob because Bob cared about people and the people that would came into Wolf Supermarket routinely, you know, took care of Bob and uh, he was just a great guy. And so he made an impression on me because I remembered his name, what, what is this, uh, 40, 30 years later, 31 years later? Right. So well, I guess it's 41 years. I'm old. I, I, I tell you that we have, you know, compliments all the time by those that uh, have um, have allowed them to go and work in their space because with the joy that they bring and actually they waste no time, you give them a task and they will be better than some of us that yes. are lingering work because they're just like on a mission and it gets done yep. and it gets accomplished. Yep. So well, little does the world know sometimes if they haven't given up, been up, haven't, and given an opportunity to work and to really, you know, embrace that opportunity of, of that workforce feel and what the, the joy that they bring and the actual work ethics that they have, um, you know, they're missing out. Yeah, it, it makes them special, right? Correct. I mean, it, it makes them special. Correct. And, uh, I absolutely get that. And so, you know, what I hear behind the scenes is you're, you're supporting them, but then you're exposing the community to a, a resource that is truly special. And right. not not in the special needs way, but you know, having people that will come to work, do their job with a smile on their face is a very valuable commodity. So right. that's awesome. All right. So um, you mentioned in your bio your children, your extraordinary children, and so I wanted to ask about. I wanted to give you a platform to talk about and to brag about your extraordinary children. What what makes them extraordinary, and how have they guided your life's mission? So when I look back, um, I sort of learned how to be a mother by the example of my individual babies as I got my Down syndrome babies and autistic babies from when they were very young at a very young age. So I sort of learned how to have a routine, how to change pampers, how to train, how to, you know, spoon feed in a different, more therapeutic way. So I knew that once I had my children that I was, they were going to be immersed in the special needs community at a very young age, and they were going to be part of this, you know, of this world from the very, very beginning. So I made that a point from from when they were in my belly until I had them and and then any opportunity that I had they'd come to work with me they had summer camps with me immersing into an integrated summer camp that we had our staff um you know come in and um, be able to hire a, a significant person to take care of them while going on field trips or activities they would do activities with the special needs individuals so mm -hmm. that that was extended through their life so um, they don't see our special needs community as different. Um, they've been raised that way. So I see when I feel like when they have the opportunity to find this in our community, they embrace it. They go up to them. They make them part of their group. I know yeah. my daughter had a situation. You know, she went to the University of Miami and there was an autistic individual that was alone all the time. 
And my daughter went and sat down with him, talked to him a little bit, just because he was different. People weren't talking to him. Yeah. And she was like, no, 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 you're coming to my group. You, you're going to be part of this. And all of her friends then just, they became a group. And it was the initiation of her just taking that opportunity to see that somebody was left out to bringing them in only because he was autistic. So yeah. my son does the same thing. It's like, we have a magnet. We go out, it's, it's, it's like a magnet. They feel it. It's a smile. It's an embrace. And so um, why I say that, that my children are extraordinary is because, you know, you dream of it to happen before they're born. But when you see it in actuality um, and it happens right before you, you say, wow, okay, I did something right. Yeah, congratulations. That's awesome. What a great story. And uh, I don't know if you saw the video. There was a video that I that I was exposed to. I can't even remember Facebook, LinkedIn or something where uh, there was a special needs uh, young man who, who got into a fraternity. Mm. Did, you, did you see that video? I haven't seen that. It was just published a couple of weeks ago. And so I, I, I in fact, I think it's uh, my son will be embarrassed because uh, he was he was in the fraternity and I can never remember which fraternity it is. <laughs> it wasn't this fraternity. It was a different university. Right. And uh, and you, the video was him opening the letter that he was sec- accepted into the fraternity and then all of his fraternity brothers sort of rallying. Oh gosh, him. I would have started crying. <laughs> I know. I, me too. I would have right? been like, oh my yeah. God. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Uh, it, it was a great moment and uh, it was genuine. And so, you know, so your life's mission is 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 alive and well in other places. That's uh, you just happen to be you just happen to be driving the effort there in Miami. So that's Trying great. Congratulations on having great kids. So, OK, I, I want to shift gears just a little bit. You mentioned it in the run up there in your background. You took a detour and I'll try not to keep from, I'll, I'll try not to cry myself and then I'll try not to make you cry. You talked about doing the two year stint in, in hospice. Um, my parents, both of my parents have passed as well. My father passed of, well, he didn't, he didn't die of dementia. He, he probably died of starvation, unfortunately. And, uh, and then my mother died of cancer and, uh, hospice was a big part of both of those and it was awesome. So tell me about your detour. And I think that everybody sees hospice as a different way, right? Some people see it as a very sad moment in their lives just because of the process. And I think that's where I took a turn just because of the experience that I had. Um, I lost my parents, you know, younger in my thirties. Um, Mm -hmm. obviously they were older and had me older. So I got to have them less time, but it was also a process of, um, my aunt and uncle who also raised me and having to, uh, care give for them. When one was getting sick, then, then the other one would pass and then taking care of another one passing, taking care of another one passing, taking care of another. So my four biggest, you know, supporters and my family, they all, it was one right after the other. I didn't have time to like mourn one that the other, I had to take care of the other one. And so that, that took a toll, but, um, you know, I, I remember working you know, and starting. And I said, you know, I want to take this path because I want to heal. I needed to heal in the process. And I said, what, what better way to do that than to, to serve and help those understand as it is a part of a business. There's another part to it. That's that, that soulful part of explaining and helping those parents, those families through, especially when they're not, they don't know and, or have never been through it. I think what helped me as a rep was when I met with families is sort of like putting, giving them a story and understanding what they were, you know, facing. Um, it, you know, some sometimes coldness doesn't take you anywhere when you're trying to like, it's not selling, but it's like, this is part of a process that we have to go through. And, and making that decision is very difficult. A lot of different paths in hospice and how people feel about it and um, the acceptance portion of it, the reality of things what they're here to do or how we're there to help. And so, um, you know, I learned a lot. Um, I, 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 I was able to work with a company, um, Opus Care, that really paved the way for me and helped me out a lot. I think I took it, I ran with it, you know. I was very successful and I feel that it was just a part of me that came with some wounded um healing process that I needed to go through. And that's why I think I did so well. Um, And then I got to do what I needed to do, which was cure my heart, help. The more I helped, I think the more adrenaline I had. That's what what was going on. People, my friends were like, I don't want you doing that anymore. This is so sad. You're working crazy hours. You're working weekends. You're on call. You're showing up in the hospital at the wee hours of the night. Like, what are you doing? 
like you're you're feeding patients, like you're you're helping the nurses. What like what what what's I'm like I am happy I'm serving and helping those that need it during these times and their families. So, you know, I I I I wasn't myself for those two years. I was a little bit where I immersed myself in it, but I, I sort of had to do that to get out of it almost and be like, I'm okay now. I can move on and do what I'm here to do. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what a great story. So, you know, I, I'll pull on a thread. So that, that whole hospice story that you told, and, and I can hear your heart trying to, trying to lead the families through the inevitability of what was going to happen, right? Which was really hard. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned also in your bio, it sounds like you have a special place in your heart for the parents of these kids with, or these kids and adults with special needs and trying to help them sort of know their path and the best path to help their kids and or their adults make the most of, of the opportunities that they have. Maybe tell us a little bit about where that comes from. Yeah. Um, that's the part that I was explaining at first that I got to see babies through you know, elementary, middle school, high school. And I had adults that grew up with me. I was seeing our older population where their parents are passing and our social work team is helping guide them into living independently in this, in, in, in ha group homes. Um, sometimes it's heartbreaking because it could happen from what, it, it just happened to us where we had a parent, a, a mom who's had surgery a week later passed sister had to run social workers here had to run son mom is like all he knew had him like perfect perfect outfit combed i mean he was and now their world completely changed our world changed here for him making sure he's you know emotionally well um and so that's the part i wasn't used to that i thought okay i know all about special needs guess what i'm just <laughs> learning yeah, I'm just learning. That's not it. And then I'm seeing individuals that are at the end of life. Yeah. Thing, um, where I wasn't used to that. I've had a few, but this is a different, you know, a, a different emotion altogether. You know, sure. you're seeing the siblings and uh, the families coming together and some don't have families and some are, are just being taken care by caregivers. And so it's a whole different dynamic that I was not ready for. And now that I'm here, I'm just like embracing it and going, huh, what? Yeah. Like this year has been like just eye opening, eye opening experiences for me. You know, students having surgery where you don't know what's going to happen, taking, could take a turn where they're intubated, where it's like, are they going to make it? You're in the, you're in, you're in the hospital with the families holding their hands, just like, we're going to get through this. Who do I need to talk to? What do we need to do? Like, just, you know, you, uh, you're invested. You are, this is your family member. This, these yeah. are your people. Yep. So this is where, where I have thought and I know it all and I don't yeah, know. You, you thrive. And so, you know, so again, I'll go back to, to Alex. She, she said you were a force of nature. She said that you were incredible. And obviously it just listened to you talk about, you know, your passion for it. So at Parker, one of our core values is having a servant's heart. You have, you have to have a servant's heart to work at Parker. That's, that's my, that is my, uh, that's, that's my core value. That was my contribution to the core values. All the leaders had sort of their own. Um, it, it, it took me until I delivered my mother's eulogy to realize that I got it from her. And so, uh, I'm wondering what your, What's, what's, what is the source of your servant's heart? Little did I know that my father had a sister that was born with meningitis. She was in a wheelchair into her 20s as she passed. He was the sole person that took care of her in and out, day in, day out, wheelchair, bathing. Um, and he never told me after years of working with special needs what he did. Wow. So in Cuba, my grandfather wanted him to run a cow ranch, which is what we, what we, what they had. And my father said, I want to be a doctor and I want to go to the military. And my grandfather said, well, no, you need to, he's like, well, my sister is gone. And that's all I had that was keeping me here. I want to find a cure. I want to find a cure. So my father became um, a doctor that specifically finds those different um, uh, diseases type of person. Yeah. And um, that's what he did. Oh. Little did I know in my journey through hospice, I would find a man who my father was his professor. And before he passed, he told me a story of my father. And that's when I knew like my mission in hospice was, it was. Yeah. Yeah. You was meant to be. Yeah. yeah. So 
I hear a lot of you and your father. Sounds yeah. like you had a mission. You were, had a mission. It's yeah. in your DNA. Uh, that's uh, what, a, what a great story. And my aunt also that raised me. She was a nurse. And that's all I saw, just giving and helping. And that's all I saw. Yeah. That's, that's great. What a great story. Okay. So, so now let's, let's jump back to the wow center. What, what can people who don't have a lot of exposure to special needs, uh, to the special needs population, what, what do we need to know and how can we help you? You know, just come by here and volunteer. I mean, if you have a company and you want to really immerse in a, in a retreat day and spend some time in a classroom and see what it's like, um, I, it'll change your your day, your month, your year, your concept in life. Um, we take things for granted sometimes. And I think that's what wow does to a lot of people that walk through our doors. Um, just by doing that is huge. I mean, we're a nonprofit, obviously. We're on, always in need of funds um, and donations um, as our individuals get funded by the med waiver. And that's how they pay the program. We don't ask for anything more. Um, we're just solid heart givers and so that's what that's what this program is is missing we we are just hoping for the donors to come and 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 hoping for things to you know sort of visit to embrace this amazing you know program that we have but obviously it, it has it has its you know we have to continue to to work and and, and do the uh, you know god's work yeah for sure so if if i went to the website would i find a place to to donate yes okay all right, I'll, or I'll volunteer. Do that. Or volunteer. Yeah, well, I, I don't live in Miami. Is there a Wow Center in Indianapolis? <laughs> no, I wish. I I think our biggest dream would to be have to have a Wow Center everywhere in every state. Yeah, it would be amazing. Okay, so there's just one today. Correct. Okay, well, it sounds like you're you've got your next life's mission. Oh my god! You can god. make you can make Indianapolis your second place. If I have time, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll keep yeah, going. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, Something that we ask all of our segment two guests is if they, we ask them if they have a parking story. Do you, do you have a parking story? I have an older brother who always took care of my parking because he was a police officer. Oh, okay. So <laughs> don't little, tell Alex. A little lucky. She knew because she went to went to school with my cousin. So, but um, I don't know. Parking stories. That's the, that's the worst. That's just giving it to my brother to take care of it for me. Yeah. Well, so, so what I would say to that is just like, uh, having people that will help you and you or taking for granted the, the skills that we have, right. You begin to take advantage of somebody who, who, you know, you know, somebody in parking. I tell, I tell my family members all the time, it's good to know somebody in parking, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe, maybe then maybe your hook is that you appreciate parking people more than most. I do. Because your brother took care of you. Yes. Absolutely. And now that I have a Alejandra doing so much for our community, I respect it, pay, do what I need to do to get it done. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, the parking people on this podcast are going to love that because as you might imagine, lots of people are trying to find ways to get free parking and they don't understand why you have to pay. And, uh, you know, that was a long time ago when it happened yeah, to me. Well, now, you know, it's okay. Your brother, if he was a police officer, he paid his dues. He, he probably earned some free parking. It's yeah. okay. Public service and all of that. I, I think we can give you, we'll give you a pass on that. But you know, the bigger point is that, you know, it, you at least accept that, that you have to pay for parking because we have to pay our people and we have to pay our taxes and Absolutely. we have to maintain our facilities. And th there's, there's real cost to parking. So. I know that very well now. Yeah, that's good. All right. So uh, we're coming around the bend here. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you wished that I would? Um, no, not really. I just wanted to say how extraordinary Alejandra is. An example of a woman and um, glad she led, she led me here. Yeah. We, we talked a little bit about how, um, you know, one of the things that I appreciated most about about Alex is that she she did not use the woman card to get ahead. She just signed up to go do the work and get the work done and let her work speak for itself, which is uh, that was I'm sure it was twice as hard. She would tell you it may have been three times as hard, but she wasn't going to uh, rest on. She wasn't she wasn't going to take any any charity, as it were. She was just going to do the work. And obviously she's gotten where she is because of the extraordinary work that she's done. She's always been like that since a young girl. Is that since right? Remember in high school, she's always been that 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 person. 
Yeah, but it's awesome. Well, you, you two, both of you are extraordinary. Obviously, again, you can you can hear how large your heart is. And uh, the, the people at the WOW Center are super lucky to have you. Thank you. Okay, well, then I will say to, to sort of wrap things up, thank you for your time. Thank you for all the things that you do for the community of special needs. I think about, I see older parents with older kids and you worry about what's going to happen when the caregivers are gone. And the fact that the WOW Center is there for at least 400 people, hopefully in January uh, in Miami is absolutely phenomenal. I'll rest easy knowing that it, that there is at least a population in Miami and I'm sure all over the United States uh, that, that, there's, that there's structure and support for those, for those individuals because I'm sure that's super hard. So thank you for joining us today. Thank Appreciated you. the conversation and, uh, and I'll, make, I'll, uh, I'll be sure to get to the, to the WOW Center website and uh, make a contribution on your behalf to, to say thank you and to support your efforts. Thank you so much. I appreciate that so much. Okay, that's a wrap on this episode of Harder Than It Looks, Parking Uncovered, presented by Parker Technology. Please leave us a review if you liked what you heard. Make sure you tune in next month as we continue to uncover tips, tricks, and best practices to manage what we all know is harder than it looks. Parking a car. Bye for now.